Hello everybody, Leonard here, and I am with my friend Mulinga Cello, and he is a pastor from Zambia, and we have had the pleasure of serving together over the past week and a half uh, here in Kajairo, Kenya, uh, working with the Developing Workers Organization, uh, hosting some medical clinics, and, and also offering some spiritual counseling to go along with it. And one of the highlights of my trip is uh, during a team time, we had the opportunity to have Mulinga share his story and it is exceptionally powerful. So I have asked Mulinga to sit down with us and just tell that story so that we can share it um, to anyone who is willing to listen. So Mulinga, go ahead. Thank you so much, Leonard. I am so grateful to have this opportunity of sharing my story. As he has said, my name is Mulenga Chela. I'm from Zambia. I, in my last year of high school, I heard the Lord call me into ministry and I purposed to serve the Lord in full-time ministry as a pastor. Then I became actively involved in the local church and uh, a number of ministries they were doing, which included street kids ministry, evangelism, youth ministry, etc., etc. During that time, I saw a need of going to seminary, so I went to a Bible college nearby. In the second year of that Bible college, our professor was teaching us on leadership preparation. And he said that God prepares people for ministry and leadership in various ways, which include prison. And he gave an example of Joseph and how Joseph was wrongfully imprisoned. And later on, God used his time of imprisonment for something good. And uh, our lecture, out of the blues, pointed at me and he said, you know, God can even take this young man from this classroom, Mulenga, and send him off into prison so that God can prepare him for ministry. I looked at him in shock. I thought, why me? <laughs> Among all these other students, why me? Later, I went to my usual place of prayer and I prayed. I said, Lord, I don't want anything like imprisonment to ever happen to me. If you want to prepare me for ministry, I'll study the Bible. I'll do everything else you want, but not imprisonment. A few days later, I was watching TV and there was this uh, white elderly American woman teaching on surrendering to the will of God. And she said, if God is calling you in any way, surrender. Even if he's calling you to be imprisoned so that you can be, preach the gospel there as a prisoner, surrender. And those words pricked my heart. For some reason, I came to a strong conclusion that the Lord was calling me to be imprisoned so that I could preach the gospel in prison. And I had a strong conviction that I should surrender to the will of God. So that day I went to my usual place of prayer and instead of resisting, I said, Lord, I surrender to your will and your purpose for me, even if it means imprisonment. After I prayed that prayer, 10 months passed. Then I was introduced to a man who said he was a pastor coming from a neighboring nation called Tanzania. If you have your map of Africa, you have right at the bottom of Africa, South Africa, then Zimbabwe, then my home country, Zambia, on top of Zambia, Tanzania. That's where he said he came from. He was helping orphans and widows, he said, and doing a lot of charitable works. And he said, I like you and I'm inviting you to come with me. I jumped on that opportunity, started off with him from Zambia into Tanzania. When we arrived in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, to my shock and surprise, police officers pounced on us. One of them was holding a pistol to my head and he said, you are under arrest. I was shocked, scared and confused. Later, I asked the officer, I said, sir, what's going on here? The officer then told me that the man who had invited me was not a minister. He was not a pastor. He was actually an international criminal driving a stolen vehicle and they said that because I was with an international criminal in a foreign country in a stolen vehicle, chances were I was his ally. And they ended up sending me into prison for two years, three months. The first day I w was taken to police lockup, the police station was a building that was smaller than an average uh, two-bedroom house in America. And it had one main room where the prisoners were put. There were about 30 prisoners in an average size of a bedroom. And uh, inside that room, there was uh, a toilet. And the toilet had no running water. So all the 30 plus men who were imprisoned there would use it. And it would be cleaned every two weeks. So the smell there was so disgusting and awful. So much so that as you entered the police station, it hurt my nose. It was so bad. After being taken in the police station, the policeman took my money and my wallet. 
and he pushed me inside the police lockup. Now, before he pushed me, there were some men who were arrested before me who were criminals on the streets, and they started asking me for money. Well, the officer took the money from me and he locked me up. Five big guys who were criminals on the streets that were arrested, they jumped on me, held my hands and legs and started searching me for more money. When they discovered that I had nothing, they were angry. They started cursing me, slapping me, kicking me. Finally, they grabbed me and threw me inside the room that had, that was used as a toilet. It had this much, this thick of urine and human excrement that had decomposed and they, they threw me right into it. When I tried to come out of it, they became angry and they kicked me. So I ended up spending the whole night inside the human excrement and I cried. I said, Lord, why? Why have you allowed me to suffer like this after I've been seeking you and serving you faithfully as a pastor and I've never done anything that would deserve me to be imprisoned? The following morning, after spending the whole night inside human excrement, two of the guys who had beaten me up, called me out of the toilet and they said, you know what, we noticed that you prayed the whole night. Can you come out of there and come and pray for us so that we can be released from our imprisonment? And I looked at them in shock. I thought, these guys beat me up, threw me in the toilet, and now they now want my prayers. So as I was thinking about my response, the Lord compelled me to respond with love and I went there, laid them to Christ and prayed for their release. And guess what happened? The doors of the prison were opened, they were taken out of prison and I was sent from there to the main prison where I spent uh, my two years, three months. The prison that I was sent to was constructed during the colonial days so it was constructed to hold a maximum of 1500 prisoners but it had 5000 prisoners inside the prison there were domes constructed to hold 15 men they had 75 maximum men so the way we slept in prison a single mattress would be slept by three people a mattress that was this wide would be slept on by three people and the way we slept we slept on our sides one person would face this direction and another one this direction another one this direction from one corner of the room to the other corner of the room and there was only one toilet to use the food in prison was bad every day we had partially rotten powdered corn boiled in water and beans that was uh, bad there were cockroaches and sticks in it. It was boiled in water. There were no, no ingredients in it, nothing like cooking oil, onion or anything. We were lucky when we had salt and that was our daily meal. After going in prison, I started complaining. I thought, Lord, why? Why would you allow me to suffer like this? During those days when I was complaining, I was introduced to a man who was wrongfully imprisoned for since 1973 he had been in prison for over 40 years and the man was preaching the gospel every day the man was oozing with love joy and kindness and uh, even though he was saving life imprisonment for a crime that he never committed he was saving the Lord as a pastor loving on prisoners leading them to Christ and after I heard his testimony guess what I stopped complaining. I stopped having pity parties because I came to understand that here is a man who had lived more years than I had lived on earth and yet he was serving the Lord passionately and I was only in prison for a few days and I was busy complaining. And the man inspired me to stop complaining, stop having pity parties and I started preaching the gospel with him. And this became our daily program. In the morning, after being released from the lockup, we would preach the gospel. In the afternoon, after having our one meal, main meal, we continued preaching the gospel. In the evening, I preached the gospel in the room where I was placed. And I'm so grateful to the Lord that during my time in prison, I preached the gospel to men who had lived wicked lives as hardcore criminals. I preached the gospel to people who had never been in a church building. I preached the gospel to Muslims and I'm grateful for the lives that the Lord saved. How did I get out of prison? The man who had deceived me and told me that he was a missionary, uh, a pastor, and yet he was uh, uh, a criminal, was arrested with me. After a few days in prison, I came to discover that the man was wicked, very crafty, and he was a human trafficker. 
The man had plans of escaping from prison, but when his plans failed, he decided to commit suicide by taking an overdose of medicine. So instead of dying, the man became very sick. He simply lay on his mattress, had severe diarrhea, couldn't move, couldn't walk, couldn't even uh, open his mouth to speak. And when he became that sick, the prison officer in charge of the prison called me in his office and he said, Mulenga, we know that you are a pastor and you are here because of this man. That, but now that he's very sick, we advise you just to leave him alone and let him die because if you help him it would mean that you are his ally in all the criminal activities he's done and you'll be convicted with him so leave him alone and don't let him die I'm so grateful to the Lord that when I walked into that prison, I carried my Bible with me and I read that Bible every day. I prayed through the Bible every day. As I read the Bible in prison, I felt the word of God become alive to me. The Lord speak to me and strengthen me. And I came across a passage in the book of Matthew chapter 5 verse 44 that says, love your enemy. And I heard the Lord telling me to reach out to my enemy, even though I was advised not to. And the Lord was telling me just to love on my enemy. It was a difficult thing to do. As I continued praying and fasting in prison, the Lord compelled me to obey his word. So off I went to help my enemy. The man was very sick and I started nursing him literally the way a mother nurses a toddler for two weeks. I couldn't go to the rest uh, toilet, so I cleaned his underwear, washed him, picked his uh, uh, waist, threw it in the toilet, cleaned him with my bare hands, washed him uh, for two weeks. I joined long queues in prison, get food and go and feed him. And in those days, I became very thin. Prisoners were looking at me with pity. They said, you know, all of us are in prison, but you are suffering more than us because you are here through something that you did not do and you are helping the man responsible for imprisonment. In those days, I started asking myself, I thought, what's life? What's the meaning of life when you're eating bad food? You've been wrongly, wrongfully imprisoned. You, you are sleeping in a crowded place filled with bed bugs and ticks, etc., etc. What is life? The Lord started teaching me that life is an opportunity that God gives to us. It's an opportunity to love, to serve, to honor God and mankind. That even though I was wrongfully imprisoned, the Lord had given me a great opportunity to love my enemy, to serve my enemy, and to honor God by doing that. So as I continued cleaning him, washing him, feeding him for two weeks, I was saying to the Lord from the depth of my heart, I said, Lord Jesus, as I love this man and care for him, I'm doing it in obedience to your word. I'm doing it as an expression of my love to you. I'm saying I love you. And amazingly, as I said those words to the Lord, I felt the peace of God that surpasses all human understanding rest upon me. I felt the presence of the Lord that enabled me to carry on during my time in prison. By the grace of God, after two weeks, that man recovered. And uh, I, 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 after he recovered, I let him be by himself because of his wickedness. But whenever he saw me in prison, he would shed tears because of the way I had loved him after the awful and the bad things that he had done to me. Later on, the time of defense came. And when that time came, the same man that had helped, who had now recovered, stood up in court before the magistrates, judges, and everyone else, pointed at me and he said, this man is an innocent man. He doesn't know anything about all my criminal activities. I simply carried him in the vehicle as an ordinary passenger. And those words he spoke opened the doors for me to be released from prison and he was convicted for 10 years. If I had disobeyed the word of God and not loved my enemy, that man would have died and possibly police officers would have convicted me in his place to show that they had uh, done their work. But after obeying the word of the Lord, the Lord took me out of prison. I went back to Zambia, continued pastoring, continued Bible school education. And during that time, one of the former presidents of Bela University in Texas came to Zambia for a mission trip, heard my testimony, and he decided to invite me to Waco, Texas, so that I could share my testimony. When I shared my testimony at the school, they decided to give me a full scholarship that enabled me and my wife to go to the USA and get my master's and my doctorate in divinity. Right now, we've moved back to Zambia where we are leading a church. It started in 2018 and today it's over uh, a thousand members and we have a lot of ministries that are running through the church, helping a lot of orphans, widows, 
kids in the slum and a lot of other activities that the Lord is doing through uh, the ministry. Thank you so much for uh, hearing my story. Over to you, Leonard. Great. Well, thank you. So if you heard that, I'm sure it's touching you as much as it touched me the first time I've heard it. And you may be like me and you had many more questions. Uh, so if you do have questions, uh, certainly you could reach out to myself and I could get them, uh, pass them on to Malinga. But Malinga, is there a way that uh, folks could get a hold of you to either ask questions or to learn more about the awesome ministries that you're doing in Zambia? Yes, please. Number one, I have a Facebook page. That is a personal page. It's, it's um, under the name Mulenga, M-U-L-E-N-G-A. Uh, Chela, C-H-E-L-L-A. You can also go to our website. It's uh, www.christlifezambia. Christ Life Zambia. And you'll be able to see the number of uh, different activities that we do and uh, find out more information from there. Thank you. Okay. And so very last question. Uh, what would you say for in the ministry right now would be your top prayer request that anybody watching this video um, that you would be inviting them to pray for along with you thank you very much please pray for our ministry pray number one that uh, we can have more people who can visit us from the USA if you are interested in ever coming for a mission trip uh, our, our church is one of the best places that you can come to and serve the Lord mm -hmm. secondly please pray that the Lord may continue empowering us to continue helping the young girls that we picked from the streets and we gave them a decent home that the Lord can continue enabling us to have the resources to do that. Pray that the, the number of uh, kids we help in the slum, 500 in total, can continue have uh, the opportunity of being empowered and trained and uh, taught the gospel. Please pray that uh, more and more people may hear the gospel of Jesus through our ministry. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. Thank you guys very much for watching. Bye.